You are listening to the Dare to Love podcast with your hosts, Sonica Tinker and Christian Peterson, founders of LoveWorks. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is your hosts, Sonica Tinker and Christian Peterson talking with you today. We're really excited about it. We're excited to speak with you about fear. (laughs) It's a topic on our minds a lot these days as we're preparing for our upcoming Fearless Life, Fearless Love workshop next month. Yes, indeed. And both Sonic and I know something about fear because for both of us, fear has been a steady companion while and while fear is more of a supportive friend to us now that was not always the case and i guess like most people fear has stopped us from doing many of the things we wanted and in many ways being the kinds of people that we wanted to be i remember one of my early experiences that where fear stopped me was in high school when i used to i, I used to admire the song girls so they were not quite like cheerleaders. They would do the, like these dance routines during half times at football and basketball games. And they were just so fully expressed and just being out there dancing. And I just wanted to be like them so much. But <laughs> I was terrified. I was just terrified of trying out, terrified of failing, terrified of not getting voted in because I wasn't one of the popular girls. And so I never went for it. It kept me from, my fear kept me from going for that experience. I would have loved to see you as a song girl. Me too. (laughs) I know. Hey, I have another story that's a little, it's kind of a little backwards actually in that it didn't so much stop me from doing something that it, it made me do something. So when I was done with high school, the common practice was take a, you know, take a gap year and then get yourself back to college. In my family, that's what my brothers had done before me. There was never a question that I would go to college and get a master's degree in something. And even in my mind, there was no question that that was the only thing to do. But the only thing was, I didn't really want to do that. I had no desire. There was nothing in particular I wanted to study. I, I just really didn't want to. But finally, after many years, I did it anyway. You know, I enrolled in university and spent five or six years there. And the only reason I did it was because I was so afraid that if I didn't, you know, I was going to end up a loser. I was going to end up, you know, not amounting to anything and not having enough money and not making a good life, basically. (laughs) We could could tell you a lot of stories of times in our lives when we've been stopped by fear or we've made choices to do things out of fear that we didn't really want to do. And suffice it to say that the predominant feeling every time we have had fear be sort of the the leader of our lives, we have felt contracted, not fully expressed, safe, ordinary, flat, boring, like life, life feels kind of dull or I, you were, you have said, I, you know, I remember it's like that, a dark cloud. I know I, that's how I felt the five, six years I was at university. It was like, there was a dark cloud hanging over me. I even remember my uh, sister-in-law back then was asking me, are you, are you like, okay, are you happy? You just look so, I don't know, you look too old and too dark. And she was totally right about that. Yeah, too serious. <laughs> well, hey, luckily fear hasn't always stopped us. And thank goodness for that, because we would not be where we are today if we had. So we're going to tell you, tell you a couple of times when fear didn't stop us and what got produced as a result. So I'll say that um, when I was in my late 20s, actually, I had been participating in these courses that I just loved. And the facilitator one day just spontaneously put me up in front of the room to lead with absolutely no facilitator training whatsoever. And I just remember feeling completely terrified. I was so scared I couldn't even introduce myself or remember (laughs) my name, you know, where you just have those brain freeze moments. And luckily, I just stayed up there and kind of kept pushing through that fear workshop after workshop. And in the end, it really did change my life. I am so glad I I took that risk because I'm now a master course leader. Yeah, you know, I had another good story. You know, in those years where I was supposed to have gone to college in the first uh, half of my 20s, I didn't actually to begin with. Really, what I wanted to do was just to go travel and try different things. So I did. You know, I went traveling around a whole bunch in Central America and South America. I went sailing. Um, I had all kinds of weird jobs. I became a taxi driver. You know, I just tried life out, which is really what I wanted at that time. And I just kind of followed that impulse and I got all manner of fun experiences out of it. I remember a time when I was, um, I 
was working at this at this company leading courses actually and it just didn't feel right to me anymore and I remember quitting my job at for this company like around 11 o'clock in the morning and that same afternoon I signed papers to buy a house <laughs> <laughs> not exactly your standard financial <laughs> planning move <laughs> I know I was terrified I had no idea how I was going to pay the mortgage but in the end, it ended up being one of the best decisions I ever made because it was in that gap of no job, having to pay a mortgage, that LoveWorks was born. And I started my own company, began designing and leading my own courses. Yeah, I had another great experience that's very relevant to you and me standing here next to each other today. So when I, uh, I don't know, when I was around 30... I actually quit this education that I had spent five or six years at getting so at university. Suffering through. <laughs> I know. And all I needed was another couple of months to finish my master thesis. I had all the credits, all the exams, all the courses, but I just walked away from it because I had so little heart in it. And that, that took a lot of courage. And I'd say much to the chagrin of my parents, I walked away from it and I was terrified. And there's no doubt that that changed my life. It changed the whole direction of my life. I got so inspired by all this change. Actually, I quit smoking. I quit drinking. I moved to another country. I sold all my stuff and I just never looked back. I started a new life, new path, learned to take care of my body, create healthier relationships and ultimately another career path. Yeah. And I'll tell you another really big thing that changed our lives was meeting each other 15 yeah, years ago it was totally terrifying for both of us actually you know we met on the east coast we got 15 years age difference between us sonic i already had a couple of young children that are now my our children my children yeah and it was terrifying for both of us actually to join lives or even to at first pursue this relationship because we had no idea where the heck that was going to go. And I just remember for me it too, it meant divorce and having my kids have time and being on, on our own financially. And for Christian it meant moving from another country and being away from his family and yeah, starting life all over. Yep. Big, scary stuff right there. And it's turned out. We're having it sure has. This that's, how I, that's how I ended up learning to uh, lead workshops as well, which is what, of course what we do here at, at LoveWorks. So I started similarly to Sonica. Sonic, I started, just the first workshop I led was together with Sonica. Only this time it was me who was there for the first time, kind of baptism by fire, like you had done many <laughs> years prior yeah. to that. And I was terrified too. It was in it was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I was shaking in my pants. But but I did it, and you know that move totally changed both of our lives. And we you know we now lead this work together. Last one we'll share is that in 2008, we lost everything in the real estate crash. We bordered on filing bankruptcy, bordered on losing our home to foreclosure. We were terrified, counting pennies literally month by month, not sure how we were going to get through. And in the end, it totally changed our lives. We ended up getting out of debt. We refired up LoveWorks and we cranked out six figures in our first year and ended up getting to save our home. And I will say out of all of these stories, and of course we have lots more, I'm, so I'm sure you do as well, right? Every time we have stepped out of our comfort zone and leaned into our fear, we have grown like crazy. Our lives literally have changed many times over from just taking one simple action that we previously thought was undoable, some action that didn't match who we thought ourselves to be at the time, and that one action changed everything going forward. And the feeling that comes with that, I mean, there's, there's fear, but right next to that, like getting to the other side, there's exhilaration, this experience of being alive, living on the edge, like milking life for all it's, all it's worth. Yeah. And it was really that feeling. That's actually what inspired us to create the workshop you mentioned in the beginning, Fearless Life Workshop, where we get to p play all that out live right there on the spot. And, and I want to say, in addition to, you know, just the, the exhilaration that comes from stepping out of our comfort zone and overcoming some fear, we build a tremendous amount of confidence when we do that. And Sonic and I came across this great quote that's said by a man named John T. McCurdy. He was a psychologist who studied the London population after the World War II bombings, you know, when the Nazis were bombing London in the early days of World War II. And he said, 
quote, We are all of us not merely liable to fear. We are also prone to be afraid of being afraid. And the conquering of fear produces exhilaration. And then we added here, when we overcome our fears, and he further said, the contrast between the previous apprehension and the present relief and the feeling of security promotes a self-confidence that is the very father and mother of courage, end quote. Yeah, he actually talks about how courage is this skill to develop, right? And when we put ourselves in certain experiences, we actually support ourselves to grow. How we say it is that everything we want is outside of our comfort zone. Everything we want is outside of our comfort zone. But most of us aren't so eager to step outside <laughs> our comfort zone. We stay safe and comfortable instead of venturing out towards what we really want. And what keeps us from doing that, from stepping out, taking risks, is good old fear. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of things not turning out. We're afraid of losing. We're afraid of being in pain, being rejected, looking stupid. We feel so uncomfortable at the mere thought of doing something new sometimes that we stop before we start. Yeah, and to, so to understand fear better, let's uh, hear this podcast. We're going to break it down a few ways. So we'll break it down by saying that there are two categories of fear. There's actual fear and imagined fear. Now, actual fear is like, you know, when you see a tiger and you have the urge in the moment to run or maybe to fight. And you could say the uh, acronym for fear that applies to this type of fear is fuck everything and run. <laughs> <laughs> you might have heard, heard that acronym before. Fuck everything and run. Now, in this day and age, we are rarely faced with real tigers thankfully, <laughs> right? So most of our fears fall into the next category, which we call imagined fears. These are the times when we think we're facing a tiger, but there's no real tiger in actuality. We're imagining that something dangerous or bad is on the horizon, when in reality, there is no real threat at all. So in this case, we would say another acronym for fear, F-E-A-R, applies, which is False evidence appearing real. Yeah, and not knowing the difference between these two types of fear often has us confuse or link the two so that every time we're afraid, we believe we're in actual danger and we should either stop and protect our, or we should stop and protect ourselves by either fighting or running away. And this misinterpretation often makes us stop in the face of our fears. And unfortunately, that's not always the case because fear is not always telling us to stop. Sometimes it is telling us to stop, but fear sometimes has other messages for us as well. So we're going to share with you some other, some other ways of looking at fear or some other messages fear has for us. And we'll go through a few of these here and tell you how to use them or what to do instead when you are... are looking at fear from these different perspectives or different interpretations. So one of the things we've noticed about fear is that fear is telling us that we are running a negative story about the future. So think about that for a moment. Anytime you're afraid, right, you're imagining some situation in the future that you believe won't turn out. Right? We believe that something bad's going to happen. We're not going to get what we want. We're going to fail. Right? We imagine ourselves feeling powerless in the face of some future miserable event or catastrophe. We're basically caught up in worst case scenario thinking. Yeah, it's like that example I shared in the beginning of, you know, I, I went to college because I was so afraid not to. Basically, there was no actual danger, although I felt tremendous fear. And I was imagining a future where I wouldn't make it, where I would be a loser or a down and out person or someone who was, uh, I don't even know what, something bad for sure. But it was all imagined. There was no, uh, you know, in my mind, the evidence clearly told me the story that it's really bad and something bad's going to happen. But the evidence was just the voice of fear in my head. There was no actual danger. When, we're, when we are having these negative stories about the future, you know, I, I, like we're actually putting our imagination to 
poor use. I remember hearing once that fear and worry is poor use of the imagination. And this is a good example of that. Anytime we're engaging in this kind of negative thinking about the future, we're bound to feel fear. So if we find ourselves having negative stories about the future, we can consciously use that information to shift it around and imagine a creative, positive future story instead. So instead of worst case scenario thinking, let's engage in some best case scenario thinking, right? What is the best thing that could happen here in this situation? What's the upside? What are some of the positive changes that might incur in us if we were to take this risk? And you'll find as you put your imagination to good use in this way and create a positive outcome in your mind, you're going to notice your fear subside. You might even find yourself feeling excited. Now, a whole other way to think about fear is often when we're afraid, we're triggered and we're not so much thinking a negative story about the future, but we are remembering times in the past when we have been afraid, right? Sometimes when we're afraid, we're having old stories or feelings from the past reactivated. You know, maybe we're unconsciously remembering a time when we were hit or made fun of or abandoned or hurt or rejected, right? We're reminded of a time when we failed in the face of some similar risk or situation that we're, that we're facing now. So in these situations, again, we're not having a negative story about the future. It's more like we're caught up in having negative memories from the past show up. Yeah. And these scary memories from the past are often just that, <clears throat> excuse me, they're just memories. It's an image in my mind with an attached emotion and an attached story that lives basically in my mind. So today as an adult, I might be afraid of screwing up because my dad gave me some stern talking to's when I was five. And back then it was genuinely scary being scolded by my dad. It was genuinely threatening to a five-year-old. But today as an adult, there is no, in quotes, dad who's going to scold me. It all is taking place in my imagination or in my memory. I remember the, you know, you might have heard of the comedian who is now a motivational speaker. His name is Kyle Cease. He said it like this. He said, it's like, it's like making a drawing of a scary monster, then taping it to the wall, and then you forget all about hanging it there. Then later, you come back and you see the drawing and you're like, ah, when you see the monster, what's that? Because <laughs> you forgot that you put it there in the first place. Now, what's great about having old stories reactivated from the past, right? These memories kind of resurfacing is that we can use them when they arise to heal. Like we can bring them up to consciousness to examine them to heal them. And really by going back to these memories, we can use them to glean important lessons. We can replay them out from different perspectives. Kind of how we think about it in our work is going back and doing a do over in your mind where now it turns out in the way that you wanted it to. So you can come out of the experience with, with a different memory, with really a different experience in your body and different beliefs and stories associated with your new experience. Or sometimes maybe it's going back and communicating with people, saying something you never said that needed to be said, or finding forgiveness. In each of these cases, you can actually use fear when you know, you're know you getting stopped by memories from the past. You can bring them up and use them to actually grow. So you can uh, expand beyond those limitations of your past experiences. Now, another thing I find interesting about fear as well is that when we are, you know, caught up in either of those that we just spoke about, right? So we're imagining a negative future, you know, things not turning out, or we're being reminded of times when we failed in the past and that's stopping us. What's interesting about both of those is that we're not present, right? When I'm caught up in memories from the past or I'm caught up in the future, I'm not actually being here right now. So sometimes we could even use that to support us, right? Because fear is communicating to us that we're not being in the moment, which is often where we have our, our 
power to actually do something right in, in this particular moment. So if we, if we notice that we can actually use our experience of fear to slow ourselves down and bring us back into this present moment, right? Back to this moment again, where we can almost always calm ourselves. We can almost always find some action that will take care of whatever needs to be addressed in this particular moment. Yeah, that's really good. And another message we see in fear is, I don't trust myself to make good on whatever arises. Or, you know, we have beliefs about ourselves, namely that, or examples that we are unworthy and incapable, that we're powerless to affect positive change, and hence, we're not going to get what we want in the end. We can therefore use our fears to cultivate different beliefs, contrasting beliefs, productive beliefs in ourselves. We can ask ourselves questions that point to trust and competence, such as, how would I be in this situation if I trusted myself to have everything turn out perfectly? Or how would I be if I knew I was enough? Or if I knew I was worthy of good things? Or what can I do to make a difference right now, right here? I remember a time when I was really terrified and I put a little uh, three by five card on my bulletin board that said, I am a resourceful woman and I can make good on everything, anything. And that really got me through that period during 2008 when we almost lost everything is instead of going backwards into fear and panic, I used that declaration to support myself to cultivate a belief in myself that I could absolutely take care of everything that was showing up. Yeah, and you can see it makes perfect sense that if your much of your fear arises from making up bad stories about the future, basically that it's not going to turn out and you're not going to know what to do, you can see why cultivating the confidence that I will be able to make good on anything or I will be able to handle what shows up, well, how that would be a powerful antidote to fear. And that goes along with another way we like to interact with fear is we, we like to think of fear as communicating to us that we're about to step outside our comfort zone and that's good, <laughs> right? Yeah. We're about to step outside of our comfort zone, period. It doesn't mean anything negative about the past. It doesn't mean anything negative about the future. It doesn't mean something bad's going to happen and we should stop. It simply means we are growing and expanding beyond where we have been before. So we would say that the message fear gives us sometimes in a lot of instances is like, Go for it. Bravely forge ahead. Keep moving. No matter how uncomfortable you feel, keep going. Because fear is telling us in these, in a lot of situations that we're just breaking out of old stories. We're breaking out of old patterns. We're unboxing ourselves from who we've been and what we're doing. You know, we're merely telling ourselves that the action we're about to take to expand into new territory is simply breaking up the status quo. And it's actually good for us. For this kind of fear, and I, this is one of my favorite acronyms for fear, is face everything and rise. Like, go for it. Yeah, face everything, whether it's facing backwards or forwards in your life. Either way, <laughs> we're going to face it and we're going to use it to rise. I know. I, I, th I think about that Nike saying, right? Just do it. The, just, just do it. Go it. Yeah. Just go for it. Do it. And definitely one of the you could say of the side benefits of taking risks is that we often discover our fears are much worse than reality. Remember that first time I mentioned, for example, that I was, when I was leading a workshop the first time ever with no, you know, training or education, I said I was terrified, which I was. Well, really it was, it was the time before the workshop, when we were on the airplane in the days before, when we're driving to the venue, that is when I was terrified. It was thinking about leading the workshop that was terrifying. But when I was actually there, actually talking into the microphone, actually being with the people in, uh, who were participating, it wasn't that bad or scary at all. I was just in the middle of an experience then, and it went okay. But the time before, whew, that was the terrifying part. But even if I would have somehow failed then, and you know, whenever any of us happen to fail, we also just find that we'll, we'll use that to rise. We can learn from the mistakes or whatever failures it was to 
you know, to rise basically, to glean something and to build this confidence that I am going to make good on anything. We actually know a man who was so afraid of getting on stage and speaking in front of people that he literally passed yeah, out that's true. <laughs> the time he was co-leading a workshop. I'll never forget this guy sharing this with us. And it turned out that his fainting created immense vulnerability, connection, and love between him, his wife, who sort of rushed to take care of him, and the workshop participants. And as a result, he was sharing with us that it substantially changed his relationship with fear. Like he was no longer afraid of failing in front of the room ever again. And the reason was because he had already been through the worst thing, right? And it's sort of the the upside of failing or the upside of things not turning out is really when the worst thing happens and you're still okay you don't have to worry about the worst thing ever happening ever again. I know it's just like uh, McCurdy, the wartime psychologist says, you know, when we overcome our fears and step through it like this, it builds acceleration and it builds this experience that is the very father and mother of self-confidence. I know. I remember, I will never forget at a speaking gig when I told several jokes and they all felt completely fell completely flat and I took like no everybody was looking at me like what in the heck who is this person what are you and I I'll, and the whole talk was totally flat <laughs> and it was the worst worst presentation I had ever given in my life and it really did free me up it was like oh okay I survived that well that's a, I can know, pretty much do I can pretty much survive anything well that's now. another important thing we've discovered through our own mess ups is that this might sound surprising, but basically no one cares. People are so afraid of their own failures that they aren't judging you nearly as much as you think they are. In fact, they often love it when you mess up and can laugh at yourself because it gives them permission to take some risks and to make mistakes too and to be less harsh with their own judgments and their own fears of their own failures. So we have learned to uh, use that to laugh out loud at ourselves when things don't go as planned. And you can imagine having, you know, being leading workshops for a living. There are all kinds of things that don't go as planned. Yeah, we actually have a couple that we studied with that every time they messed up, they would say, oh, that was sexy. That was sexy. <laughs> and it was to help themselves not feel so afraid that they could just call it sexy and laugh at it instead of, oh, man, I'm such an idiot. Which I got to say, you know, that piece of making it okay to mess up really does reduce our, our fear. You know, a lot of our fear comes from this idea that we have to be perfect and we can't be human and it has to be exactly right. And when we really let ourselves and give ourselves permission to just be, you know, it really does relax our experience going into things. Like I remember two years ago, I participated in a Dancing with Our Stars event in Nevada City where I performed two dances with a sore hip. <laughs> I'd actually hurt myself. Um, I had hurt myself boogie boarding in, in Hawaii right before the dance, two weeks before my 60th birthday in front of some 700 people. And I was terrified. I was totally, you know, I, I wasn't a professional dancer. And I remember one day I was so afraid, so scared, I just burst into tears with my hairdresser. <laughs> but it didn't stop me. And it was kind of full. It was kind of cool. I just brought my fear with me. And on the actual evening of the event, I just took my fear out for a twirl on the dance floor. And I was so proud of how well we danced and how low to the floor I got and some of our moves and how I remembered all the steps. And so it didn't even matter because I did mess up at the start of one dance and we didn't win anything. But I just loved and appreciated the heck out of myself for risking stepping out on the edge of life yet again. Yeah, and I'd say I too, still to this day, I get scared of all manner of things. For example, you know, I just I just published in our latest newsletter a story about how I almost didn't reach out to the first love of my life when I back when I was sixteen. But I but it finally I well I actually didn't do it then, but in many other times I did. So. Um, this fear of not measuring up and not getting it right and something bad happening has definitely been a companion of mine 
I, I recently I wanted to reach out to a famous author to do a podcast interview with, you know, and my first thought I could feel the the voice of fear in my head was saying, ah, who are you to approach a famous person like that? He's probably got way too many more important things to talk talk about than what you and you know, blah blah blah. That was the voice of fear in my mind. But I actually just went ahead and did it. I just did it. And and what happened? He said, that sounds great. Thanks for asking. That sounds really fun. Let's just do it. And it was just such a good and quick turnaround example of first having the fear show up, then moving right through it and having an outcome that was pleasurable, making a new connection, making a new friend and, you know, it being useful to all the listeners. So we, we hope you've gotten valuable value here out of these different ways of seeing fear as really being our ally, our friend that's that's wanting to support us, whether it's healing the past, whether it's creating a new future, whether it's being in the moment, whether it's trusting ourselves, calling us to expand and grow. Fear is our friend. It doesn't have to stop us. It can actually be a launching pad, you know, a, a, a way for us to use our fear to become more of who we want to be and to take that fear with you into new experiences. Use it to cultivate your courage. Use it to cultivate new skills, help you become who you want to be going forward. One of our favorite mottos that we say often to each other is trust, risk, and keep a sense of humor. You know, and really we see that taking action in spite of fear is a skill to develop. We have to be able to make friends with being uncomfortable, stepping outside of our comfort zone, and moving towards what we really want to create and who we really want to be. When we befriend and enjoy our fear, it is going to serve us for life and it's going to save us from a lifetime of agony. And, you know, to be able to do that, it definitely takes practice. Yeah, I'd say, you know, it probably took me a good till I was around 30 to really get a handle on that. And the first 30 years of my life, I mean, I, I lived through untold tension, agony and misery, basically. So I, I relate to all of this very much. And not only have we gone through this process countless times, but over and over again, we now get to watch people who come to our trainings and our workshops who navigate through the discomfort only to discover every time this huge transformation, the deep love and bliss that is always available on the other side of the fear. And you can imagine also, you know, in the world of relationship, how often fear basically messes up our relationships you know it stops stopped us from reaching out to someone we'd like a date with it stops me from saying something to my spouse that i've been feeling should change and and really when fear shows up in relationships like that it should hopefully do the exact opposite which is to motivate you to reach out and do something different and in that spirit we want we want to just remind you that we are doing our fearless life workshop so if you are if you are someone who would like to take a deep and dynamic look at your relationship with fear and step way out beyond your comfort zone so that you can, you know, so you can milk this life for everything it has to offer, we invite you to go check out our Fearless Life Workshop. Uh, where you can find it is you can find it on our website, loveworksforyou.com, or you can go to the direct link is loveworksforyou.com forward slash fearless dash life. Loveworksforyou.com slash fearless dash life and we're inviting you to discover and create a whole new relationship with fear and to discover how much love and transparency and intimacy and fun there is available on the other side of your fear yeah fear doesn't have to stop you well thanks for being with us today and we're going to end with a quote here from donna markova i will not die an unlived life I will not live in fear of failing or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days, to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until it becomes a wing, a torch, a promise. I choose to risk my significance, to live so that which came to me as seed 
goes to the next as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. Yes, indeed. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Dare to Love podcast. Thanks, everybody. You have been listening to the Dare to Love podcast with your hosts, Sonica Tinker and Christian Peterson, founders of LoveWorks. And hey, if you found this podcast to be useful, would you go ahead and hit the share button and share this with your friends on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or wherever your favorite hangouts are. Thanks so much for sharing the love. And you can find more about our work at loveworksforyou.com. Thank you.